Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll. In this episode, you'll hear part one of my conversation with Paul Hanstead from Washington and Lee University. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Well, I am so excited today to talk to Dr. Paul Hansted, and I was reflecting on how it feels like a very long time since we first met over pizza in Ryan Otto's office over at Roanoke College. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed you remembered that. I couldn't. Oh, I, 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 oh, I like never I forget I pizza. Couldn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, good. Good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so at that time, you were the director of pedagogical innovation there. And uh, since mm-hmm. then, you've now become the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at WNL. And I am mm-hmm. a, a fan of yours and uh, follow you on Twitter. So I've been staying up to date on all the things that you have published there. And you've been on my list of folks to uh, invite to Digication Scholars. So I'm all, I'm all a flutter that it's, it's all happening. Um, <laughs> and I had so many different ideas about how to... Oh, you're so good. I had so so many ideas about how to um, just kind of kick this conversation off today because I know even from the first time meeting you, we have all of these interesting kinds of parallels. Um, but mm-hmm. I'm going to start with some of the um, kind of beginning words from your um, your book creating wicked students, because I think talking about wicked students is going to be something that we do quite a bit during this conversation. And um, when I first broke open that book, I know I was uh, reading some of your kind of pivotal moments, really, and um, that sounded to just kind of send you on this trajectory that I, I feel like has kind of become your your mission um, in your in your career, and maybe even with your own children, right? Um, they certainly mm-hmm. shape how we feel about education. Um, mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I wanted to just kind of start the conversation there. You uh, were describing, a time that you were sitting in an audience listening to a, a graduation speech, I believe, and were just kind of reflecting on the things that they were defining that, you know, that they needed to foster to kind of create the whole, address the whole student. And you were kind right. of thinking about how that didn't, you know, it, th- that sounds really good, um, but how that didn't really fit mm-hmm. how you felt like, um, you know, th- th- that really described what a whole student is or that that's not that's not what it's all about. You mm-hmm. know, we can't just label who our students mm-hmm. are that way. Um, so I wanted to kind of kick off mm-hmm. the conversation mm-hmm. there and hear your perspective and if you wanted to talk about what that um i don't know if it was a morning or an afternoon graduation but what what you know kind of what was going through your head at that time and where it kind of took you next and i was curious because i was trying to think back in the timeline you know you have all of this experience in the classroom as an educator too and maybe why Mm -hmm. some of that just didn't sit with you based on that experience. What I love about that question is when I have these talks a lot of the time, um, 
you know, in, in terms of our lives, right, there's kind of A to the present moment, which is Z. And I usually mm -hmm. begin right around, say, sort of L or M or N when I'm talking about with the <laughs> students. And you took it back to more like F. And then you took it back to <laughs> all the way to B. And, and I love that. So, I mean, I, I think it's probably important to begin with yes. When I'm in the classroom, I have always been drawn to the kid sitting in the corner who doesn't feel they belong. Yeah. And, and I, I'm drawn to them for a, a number of different reasons. One, I think um, because, because there's a spirit there and a fierceness there and a capacity there that, that doesn't seem to have an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and I wanna make sure that they have that opportunity, that they recognize what they're capable of and or maybe they recognize it, but somehow higher ed doesn't reinforce it, right? The, mm -hmm. the games and the trappings of what's considered success in higher ed don't align with what this student values and feels and how they see themselves in the world. Right. And that matters to me. That matters to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was an A student myself in college. I love A students. <laughs> They're awesome. But my mission is this, the, the C plus student, right? Yeah. And, and the, and part of it is I, I also remember the moments and I didn't have a, a whole lot of them. I mean, I'm, I'm a very privileged white guy, you know, growing up in Wisconsin. Um, but there were these moments where you felt on the margins. I remember sitting in, um, uh, I was at, attended my junior year. I went to Durham, England, Durham University, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I was at St. Anne's College and I was so excited to be there. And, and the first night of one of the, there, in the colleges we lived in, there was a formal night every week and you wore a gown and you went and there was wine and people talking and it was so festive. And I couldn't understand a word anybody was saying. I mean, I, I could not understand. And then there was this other layer of, it was hard to hear the accents, but also the sense of, I simply don't belong here. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a kid from a small town in Wisconsin that nobody's ever heard of. Um, and I go to a tiny little college in Iowa that nobody's ever heard of. And why am I here? And I do not belong here, mm -hmm. you know? So there's, mm -hmm. there are those moments and there is that focus on that student. And so you're right. When I'm sitting, when I was sitting in it, actually, I'm trying to think it was a graduation. I suspect, and I think I might've heard the same person speak twice and I'm not going to name oh, okay. the person. Yeah. I don't even know that I remember the name. Right. But it was this, it was this spiel where, you know, when we educated the mind and the body and the spirit. We have educated the whole student. And I'm like, yes, definitely better than just educating the mind and pretending that somehow we've caught that and we've done it and now everything's great. Because again, that's the traditional game and the traditional trappings. I hand you this material, you hand it back to me and you get an A. And if you can't do that, well, then you're just simply not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not capable enough. You're not mm -hmm. good enough. Um, I don't, I don't believe that. So, and partly I have a problem with it because it's a traditional trappings, like I just said, but partly I have a problem with it because when we get into higher ed and we start becoming not an, we start becoming systematic, that formula becomes a formula. It becomes boxes to be checked. Yeah. And we're no longer really making sure that we've done what we're saying we're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so we've educated the mind, check the body, check the spirit, check. We've got these requirements and that's enough. And it's not enough. In order to step into the world, in order to feel like your voice matters, in order to face a problem you've never seen before and have around you your boss or your colleagues or your partners, and they're all talking and sharing ideas, and to have a sense that you have the right to step up and go, well, what if, or what about, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, we've got to address, there's an affective dimension that needs to be addressed. And so that's kind of where a lot of the starting, a lot of the thinking started. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I love that you know, in speaking about that, you talked about these moments of um, belonging and how precious that is 
uh, in learning about ourselves, you know, we, I think all of us have had moments where we felt like an outsider and right. in, at the time it was probably extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, but it mm -hmm, does also mm -hmm. give you that moment of pause. Um, mm -hmm. And you might not have that moment of pause until years later, but you have that moment of pause where you recognize that that discomfort probably led you somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it could have been that you happened to connect with one person there that always wanted to go to Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met that person, but yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> you know, we, we have these connections, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. 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 I, I've always found it just fascinating how, you know, once we take that plunge, uh, or someone around us takes that plunge to kind of inquire um, what we're all about, or we mm -hmm. want to share something about ourselves that mm -hmm. you know we can we can start to kind of pull on that threat that thread of belonging, and right. um, but it does take you know it does take some you know some energy from somewhere to make make that happen. And mm -hmm. for many mm -hmm. students, I think that their experience, you know, in the quiet corner is one mm -hmm. that just has gone on for many, many years. And mm -hmm. they start to feel like that's what the experience of the classroom is. So they're not looking for mm -hmm. anything different. Mm -hmm. So it really has to come from someone else in the classroom that can kind of touch on something that, you know, you know, creates that energy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it mm -hmm. can sometimes happen from, uh, you know, wonderful educators like yourself that through so many years of experience, I think it's over 30, um, are able to kind of, <laughs> you know, with that history, know some ways to start to make that happen. Uh, and it's also really lovely when you start to see it happening among peers, when they do have the opportunity mm -hmm. to really get to know each other and each other's work. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you for talking about that experience. And I'm, I apologize that maybe it wasn't a graduation. Um, there's a lot oh, of I things going remember. on right yeah, now. Yeah. So that, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I don't. Thingy on my front. <laughs> oh, that, that, yeah, that doesn't matter. I mean, the fact that you remembered that because for, yeah, I mean, you know, I wrote the book, I, the, pub, the book was published three years ago, which means I wrote it, you know, four or five years ago. And at yeah. first when you started talking, I'm like, Oh my God, I don't remember what. Oh, oh! I, then I remembered. So no. So I'm really glad that you actually took me back there. To oh that no! Or those it moments, just, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it just really resonates with me because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think I was so I enjoyed school too, like you mm -hmm. described. But I was often, mm -hmm. you know, more of the quiet one, in the corner. Um, Mostly mm -hmm. because, you know, I wanted to draw all the time and uh, would sometimes, um, you know, folks would think I wasn't listening. <laughs> mm, interesting. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I, 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 when reading all of that, you know, and through the work that we've done at Digication, it's really been to kind of create that space for students yeah. to start to create those connections um, because they have the opportunity to share mm -hmm. what they're doing, you know, not just in the kind of turning in a paper and getting it back and getting a grade, but being more explorative mm -hmm. and having a space mm -hmm. to create and share and, and get feedback mm -hmm. and, you know, we have this 
layer where you can, you know, have assessment take place related to outcomes, but we've always been really committed to having it not be an experience that feels like checking a box. Um, so when I was reading that, I was, yeah, I, I, I was very excited and, um, I know one of the other things you spoke about that was one of your, I believe it was a professor or an advisor that you had that uh, Mm -hmm. kind of challenged you to thinking about, you know, I I brought up earlier your book, Creating Wicked Students, and they had kind of challenged you to think about um, wicked problems and that, you know, our students need to get prepared to, uh, kind of, you know, th- live through or um, solve or yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. wicked problems. So how do we, you know, yeah. how do we get them there? Um, so I would yeah. love to just hear about what you know. Tell us about that that person um, because I think mm-hmm. quite like that day listening. Uh, to you know, to that kind of description of the check boxes, this individual also really shaped you. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. I would love to hear, you know, how, how you met them and, and what that experience was like. Sure, sure. So that was that was that was Edmund Coe. And he was an engineering professor, I think, who was educated at Stanford. And then most of his career was spent at um, Carnegie Mellon. And so I had a year in Hong Kong, and at some point we we might want to talk about. <laughs> let me put it another way: at some point we should talk about general education. We might not want to talk about general education. Nobody wants to, <laughs> but, but no, um, I think we should. But I was, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, for me, it's 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 really where I get my geek on. Um, he was. I was in Hong Kong in 2009, 2010 as part of a gen ed revision uh, there. The entire region was shifting from a three-year model to a four-year model. That included the liberal arts. And Edmund Ko was at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology at that point. And, and I met him. It's amazing. We were on a... a an island just off of Hong Kong, where we'd gone, a whole group of people had gone for a hike. And then I'm sitting at this table next to this guy that I think I've heard of, I think I'd heard him speak once or twice before. And, and, and we're, you know, we're like eating fish with chopsticks. And we start, he starts talking about this thing, these wicked problems, right? That engineers face. And there are problems where the parameters are shifting, where the dynamics are in movement so that the way the problem looks on Tuesday, it might look completely different um, the next Tuesday or the next month or the next time that you encounter the problem. So think about um, uh, in Chicago in the 1880s, 1890s, they wanted to build skyscrapers so they could be just like New York, you know, real American Mm -hmm. city. And they dug down and there was no bedrock. So that's a wicked problem. They had to create something. The solutions that had worked before don't exist. Um, COVID is a is a terrible and excellent example of a wicked problem because um, we're constantly uncertain, right? We were, we've been uncertain from the very beginning. Do you wear masks? Do you not wear masks? Do you distance? Do you not distance? Is it aspirant? Is it is it found on surfaces? Um, uh, how do we treat it? Um, are we out of the woods now or is this Delta variant going to take us back in there? So constantly in movement, oftentimes competing forces coming at play, you know, politically, Mm -hmm. we see that here. Um, And the solutions are going to draw from a lot of different areas. And I think this is kind of what ties in with both general education and e-portfolios, right? That part of what e-portfolios are about are putting the pieces together and making a meaningful, sensible, whole out of all this different information. Um, so what Edmund Kill, his argument was, you know, engineers lead or when they when they enter the workplace, they're facing almost constantly wicked problems. Mm-hmm. Yet the education they receive at the university is tame. Okay. <laughs> the problems are fixed, they're set, there's a clear answer, right? And And my response to that is, it's, it's everybody. All of our mm-hmm. students are graduating college and facing wicked problems. We live in a world in flux where 
social media? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? How do we overcome the political disparities and gaps we have right now? How do we deal with poverty? How do we deal with uh, addiction? Education is a wicked problem, right? If it, if it weren't, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We wouldn't be having, we wouldn't have conferences on higher ed. We wouldn't have publications on higher ed because we know all the answers. We don't. Every time we walk into the classroom, it's a different classroom. The students change from on a day-to-day -day basis. The dynamics shift. Every time we walk into the same class in a different semester, it's a different classroom. Every time we go to a different institution, it's a different classroom, a different setting, a different problem. So we're living in a wicked world. And I think so part of the argument that I, I make in the book is that, you know, I'm just following on Edmund Coe. Um, mm -hmm. All of our students need wicked competencies. And I think this again comes back to that, that, that student sitting in the corner that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And also to the traditional academic game. You know, right now we have the, the way education operates. And, and let me just pause a little tangent or coda or whatever you call it. Um, until COVID, the way education operated, <laughs> um, because COVID has thrown a lot of things into the mix and has changed the conversation. But in that classroom, you've got the, you know, you've got a variety of students. You've got students who have performed the traditional academic game really well, and they can regurgitate the material and they can take the multiple choice test and they know exactly how to write a paper in order to get an A for mm -hmm. their professor. And then they move into life after the university and suddenly their boss isn't going to give them exactly what they need to know in order to solve the task. They're writing to completely different audiences. The world has become a wicked, complicated place. And so the algorithms they were applying in university don't work. Meanwhile, we have these other kids, the kids sitting in the corner or the kid with the baseball cap on backward or the kid sitting in front of the room trying really hard to look bored because they want to send a signal to you that, that, you know, this isn't for them or whatever. There's any, you know, historically marginalized, structurally marginalized, economically marginalized. There's any number of ways of sort of thinking about. And these lines, of course, aren't, aren't you know, one-to-one. -one. But that, so the, the one kid has the attitude but then they move into the world and the world doesn't operate the way they thought it would. The other kid doesn't like the game that's being played and so doesn't know how to play that game in college. And they might have a little bit of attitude, a little bit of a sense of self. And I don't mean attitude in a bad way. Mm -hmm. um, how do we make sure that everybody in the room, how do we make sure that, that the young woman from the rural city now attending you know, UVA, a really good university, understands that she has a capacity to solve problems just as well as the kid who raises her hand every single question because they had a private school education, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure the kid that had the private school education who's putting that hand up because they've, they've done the reading and they've taken the notes and they can apply it, they forget it three days after the test is over, um, has the sense of the dynamics of the world that they're about to enter. In other words, how do we align the educational system to the complexity of the world and then within that educational system make sure that all students at all levels reach their full capacity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's what i do in creating wicked students in 178 pages i solve all the problems of higher education <laughs> <laughs> this concludes part one of our conversation with paul hanstead from washington and lee university to hear part two, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Digication Scholars Conversations is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative e-portfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. This episode was produced by Drew Albanicius. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for watching.